A handheld Doppler is capable of providing valuable information about patients with arterial and venous disease of the lower limbs. The equipment is portable and cost effective. To demonstrate its versatility, this program shows its use in a number of key application areas. The ankle brachial pressure index as a valuable indicator in the assessment of a patient with suspected vascular disease or a leg ulcer. The use of a bidirectional Doppler and a waveform recording system to provide an indication of the extent of arterial disease. Assessment of venous incompetence using Doppler and photoplethysmography or PPG techniques. Before looking at applications in detail, it's important to understand the relationship between the Doppler signal and blood flow. Doppler probes produce ultrasound signals typically between 1 and 10 megahertz. This is outside the upper limit of the normal hearing range. Ultrasound passes easily into the body, but not through air, so a water-based coupling medium is used. When the ultrasound signal encounters blood cells moving in a vessel, some of the signal is reflected at a Doppler shift frequency related to the speed of the blood cells. I'm just going to do the, blood pressure. the ankle pressure index, or API, can be used to indicate the presence of arterial disease and, if an ulcer is present, provide a guide to the etiology. A patient with suspected vascular disease should undergo a full clinical assessment, including medical history and basic investigations before the API is carried out. The use of API on a patient with a leg ulcer is covered in detail in the video Assessment and Treatment of Leg Ulcers. The ankle pressure index is reviewed briefly here. Lie the patient flat and make sure they're well rested for 15 minutes. Explain the API procedure to the patient. Hold the probe at 45 degrees, pointing towards the heart. Using the Doppler, take the brachial systolic pressure in both arms. Use the higher of the two readings in your calculations. If the readings are significantly different, this suggests arterial disease. Then the ankle systolic pressure is determined. The blood pressure cuff is placed around the leg just above the ankle. Ensure that the appropriate sized cuff is used to avoid inaccuracies. Where the cuff has to be placed over the wound, use cling film to cover it. The posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis pressures are measured and the higher reading of the two is used to calculate the API in that leg. If there's a significant difference in pressures, proceed with caution as arterial disease could be present in that leg. Excellent. Having completed the examination, excess gel is wiped from the Doppler probe immediately after use and the probe is cleaned with an alcohol impregnated wipe to reduce the risk of cross-contamination. In this example, the ankle pressures for the right leg were 80 and 85 and the brachial pressures were 145 and 150. The ankle pressure index is calculated by taking the higher ankle pressure reading of the two pulses in one leg, that is 85, and dividing it by the higher brachial pressure reading, in this case 150. The API is therefore 0.57. Alternatively, an API chart such as this could also be used. To undertake an API, only systolic blood pressure is required. The Doppler cannot record diastolic pressure readings. If the API is greater than 1, then it's most unlikely that the patient has arterial pathology. If an ulcer is present, it's probably venous in origin. Beware of falsely high readings due to calcified arteries, which may be present in patients with a history of diabetes. If the reading is between 0.8 and 1, there's an indication of some degree of arterial disease. If it's less than 0.8, the patient has significant arterial disease. If a patient has an ulcer, compression therapy should be avoided. If the symptoms warrant it, urgent referral to a vascular surgeon is recommended. Always consider the patient's underlying medical condition in addition to API recordings. The clinical reading shows that it may be safe to treat an ulcer with compression therapy, but look at the patient's history and consider the etiology at all times. Acute deep vein thrombosis is a contraindication to API measurement.
A patient with mild arterial disease may produce a normal pressure index at rest. Exercise on a treadmill may exaggerate the effect of arterial disease and make detection possible. The patient is asked to walk on the treadmill until his maximum walking distance is reached. At this point, the pressures are recorded again, and if the pressures have fallen, the test is positive. The patient's pressures may take more than 15 minutes to return to normal, which is why patients must rest before the API is taken. It's important to understand how arterial waveforms are produced from the Doppler. The probe detects the Doppler shifted frequencies reflected back from the moving blood cells and converts this into a sound produced by the loudspeaker. Higher blood velocities are heard as higher pitched sounds. The angle of the probe will also influence the Doppler shift frequencies detected, so it's important to hold it at approximately 45 degrees. This is a characteristic normal arterial waveform in the lower limb. The waveform depicts events in an artery during systole. The Doppler probe detects the initial forward rush of blood from the heart, then some reverse flow caused by the elastic recoil of the artery wall, and a final forward flow as the vessel has relaxed. This is the typical triphasic signal detected by the Doppler. Arterial disease will influence the waveform in a number of ways. For example, the restricted flow of blood from a stenosis creates a change in the waveform shape with a reduction or loss of reverse flow. As the degree of arterial disease increases, the waveform becomes increasingly damped or flattened. Using a bidirectional Doppler, a PC with waveform software and a printer, it's possible to carry out a sophisticated arterial assessment of the lower limb. To detect arterial blood flow, use a 5 or 8 megahertz probe. Adjust the gain to optimize the height of the waveform. The angle of the probe to the vessel will also affect the height of the waveform. Looking first at normal signals and waveforms, four main arterial sites are examined. The common femoral, popliteal, posterior tibial and the dorsalis pedis. For arterial examinations, the patient lies supine. Locate the common femoral artery in the groin. Move the probe gently until a strong, clear signal is obtained. A normal common femoral artery will typically produce a biphasic or triphasic signal. An initial systolic forward flow, a reverse flow phase, and a small forward flow phase before the next cardiac cycle. The popliteal artery may take a little time to locate. Place the probe behind the knee and move medially until a strong signal is obtained. Again, a triphasic signal is typically found in healthy legs. The shape of this waveform may also be influenced by arterial disease in these and other surrounding arteries. The posterior tibial also produces a strong triphasic signal. Finally, the dorsalis pedis is located and a strong triphasic signal is found. Waveforms are often used in conjunction with segmental pressures to assess severity and location of arterial disease. Making sure the patient is relaxed, the arterial readings are taken at four sites. In this case, the dorsalis pedis signal is too weak to record. The femoral waveform is relatively normal, although the patient's cardiac arrhythmia makes recording the waveform more difficult. The popliteal waveform is damped and the reverse flow and third phase have disappeared. Using segmental pressures, a clearer idea of where the stenosis can be found is built up. Pressures are taken on the arm, the thigh, below the knee and then at the ankle. The pressure recorded corresponds to the position of the Good. cuff. That's excellent. The probe is at the posterior tibial artery as the dorsalis pedis signal is too weak to record. For this patient, the pressures were brachial 170, thigh 180, below the knee 110, and ankle 75. As I'm just going to check in general, a pressure drop of more than 30 millimeters of mercury indicates a stenosis within that segment. Both the pressures and waveforms suggest superficial femoral artery disease. 
An angiogram of this patient's legs confirms a 10 centimeter occlusion in the superficial femoral artery, which has been successfully treated with angioplasty. This patient suffers from generalized atherosclerosis. Now we'll listen to the Arterial readings are taken as before, at the groin, behind the knee, at the ankle, and at the foot for both legs. Simply looking at the waveforms does not give a clear indication of arterial disease. The right leg shows biphasic signals and a weak dorsalis pedis suggesting an abnormal right femoral artery and dorsalis pedis. Taking the segmental pressures in conjunction with the waveforms revealed a significant pressure drop at the ankle, confirming significant arterial disease. The Doppler can be used for immediate post-operative confirmation of the success of the procedure and to follow the patient's progress. In a vein, the Doppler waveform will indicate valvular incompetence. With the Doppler probe pointing towards the heart, if the valves are functioning correctly, then anti-grade flow, that is flow away from the probe, is expected with no retrograde flow. If retrograde flow is detected, then this is indicative of valvular incompetence. This is a normal signal with anti-grade flow and no reflux. This abnormal signal shows enormous retrograde flow due to valvular incompetence. Problems have you had? Using a combination of Doppler ultrasound and photoplethysmography with a tourniquet, a picture can be built up of valvular incompetence. It's also possible to distinguish between deep and superficial vein involvement. Looking first at normal blood flow, the patient is examined standing up. The Doppler is used to investigate the superficial veins. The main sites typically examined are the saphenofemoral junction, the saphenopopliteal junction at the knee and sites of suspected perforator incompetence. Pointing the probe towards the heart over the vein, the other hand is used to squeeze the calf muscle to mimic the muscle pump. If the valves are incompetent, then when the pressure over the calf is released, retrograde flow will be detected. In this patient, examining the saphenofemoral junction in the left leg produces considerable reflux, indicating valvular incompetence. The right leg shows some incompetence at the groin, but the popliteal vein in the left leg shows no reflux, nor is there reflux in the right leg. Stand up for me, please. This patient had a deep vein thrombosis 15 years ago and has had multiple recurrent ulcers in his left leg ever since. The examination of the long saphenous vein, again with the probe pointing towards the heart, shows no significant retrograde flow, which is confirmed by the waveform. A small degree of retrograde flow is seen, which coincides with the closure of the valves and is normal. Moving medially from the popliteal artery, the saphenopopliteal junction is located. Again, forward flow when I squeeze this calf muscle. Again, there is anti-grade flow, but no retrograde flow. Following the vein down the leg, there is no reflux, so the superficial veins appear competent. PPG can be used in conjunction with a tourniquet to establish the extent of venous incompetence. To investigate further, a special attachment to this advanced Doppler unit allows photoplethysmography to be carried out to examine emptying of the veins and refill times. An adhesive pad is attached to the sensor. If necessary, the skin is cleaned with an alcohol impregnated wipe to ensure a good contact. The infrared sensor is attached to the leg 10 centimeters above the ankle. This is the length of the thicker black cable. Right, the patient should the relax and not move machine. until the exercise routine is started. First of all, it, it Once the sensor has detected stable blood flow control. conditions, the patient flexes his foot in time with the metronomic unit. pulse produced by the main unit. As to when to do your exercises. After you 10 pulses, the foot is left at rest for at least 45 seconds. The waveform produced during exercise is stepped at each flexing of the foot. During the resting phase, the veins refill and the time taken for the PPG curve to flatten is the venous refilling time. The refill time for this exercise is normally 25 seconds or more. In this case, the refill time on the portable printer is 9 seconds, 
indicating significant venous incompetence. The PPG procedure is repeated with a tourniquet cuff, which is inflated to 50 millimeters of mercury. The tourniquet eliminates the reflux from the superficial veins above the cuff and is placed in various positions to localize venous incompetence. An abnormal result is dependent on the deep veins. The refill time shown on the computer screen is now seven seconds, indicating the presence of deep vein incompetence. This patient, who's been suffering from a venous ulcer which is protected by cling film, has competent veins at the saphenofemoral and saphenopopliteal sites. Following the long saphenous vein down the leg, the rushing sound heard at this point indicates an incompetent perforating vein has been detected. Repeating the PPG procedure below the site of the perforation produces a refill time of 16 seconds, which is consistent with venous reflux at this level. Applying a below-knee tourniquet failed to eliminate reflux as the incompetent perforating vein is lower than the cuff. Careful interpretation of the information provided by the Doppler and PPG system aids the clinician in diagnosis of patients with vascular disease and helps identify those patients who require further investigations or treatment. Use the correct equipment and familiarize yourself with normal sounds and waveforms. And remember, interpret the results with care, taking into account all relevant factors which may influence results.